Hey folks, Master Coex here. The first week of 2022 is here, and it's time to get back to the main staple of stories we have for the channel after a whole month of Chi Chi becoming a Dragon Team member in a particular world. If you'd like to see that story in its entirety, check out the playlist above at your leisure. I mean, I'll do a full story video eventually, but gotta give it some time first. But today's story is all about Goku, or Boxer to be more accurate. Yes, this version of the main character is one that landed in a different place to the one that he did in the original story. This time, Bulma and her dad found the young one in their immense backyard within West City, and thusly, he was made not only into a pretty good martial artist, but also a dab hand when it came to mechanics and cars, which paid dividends when it came to the time when he had succumbed to his injuries against an unknown and mysterious temporal assailant. All of this coming off the back of the idea that Goku could have landed at Capture Corp and not in the woods around Grandpa Gohan's house. You'd be surprised how much of a difference a few minutes of planetary rotation can make to a story. In the last part, Boxer had been revived as according to the plan and soon joined his friends on the battlefield despite them being on the back foot when it came to overall power. And also, if you were curious, Yamcha didn't get felled by a Cyberman here. He went down like a champ and took a hit for the team in a much more glorious way, just as he deserves, quite frankly. After a rough and intense battle, neither Vegeta or Nappa were able to escape or were even offed. Instead, they wound up in the Galactic Central Prison thanks to Jaco being around on Earth on standby for their arrival. Goes to show what you can do when you give Jaco some faith and an actual plan. When the dust settled, Boxer's bestie Mark took it upon himself to become a member of the Galactic Patrol to one day set up an Earth base in a time where spatial threats were starting to head their way and it made sense to have an outpost on Earth, but for now, he had to prove his worth in the central hub. However, when the gang are distracted with the usual plan to go to Nemec to rescue their fallen allies, General Blue and Gabo, remember them? That, that's Android 16's human original, believe that this is their chance to strike while some of the overall team were out for the count. Granted, it might have been better for them to do it while Boxer was gone, but better late than never, I guess. Let's resume. Thusly, the rescue mission party started their long and uncertain journey toward planet Nemec where the potential for even stronger Dragon Balls kept their motivation high and their spirits relatively stable. Like we mentioned before, this ship is far bigger than the one Goku took solo to Nemec in the original since more people were coming with him. Having a bigger vessel that could house more people, Boxer, Bulma, Krillin, Tights, Lonjon, Chi Chi, as well as the rather curious and stubborn Piano than Uncle to Piccolo? As Jarko, Iriko and Mark are unable to contact them since they're in the middle of deep space and are also heading toward a very dark and relatively uncharted area of said space, they decide that they shall explain the situation to them themselves on planet Nemec in person, instead of having to rely on patchy communication systems any longer. Hopefully, it won't be too late for that in-person method. In order to maintain their intel gathering and as a means of showing their power, they also decide to bring in Vegeta, but they still use a cage to contain him that is dampening his power and ensuring that he cannot cause any more trouble. The patrollers wondered if the prince would like some company for the journey, whether or not he wanted his two goons assisting him as well. But after their respective failures earlier on in their campaigns, it seems that the prince had lost interest in their well-being. When asked, Vegeta looked away and effectively disowned his own kin. What this past year has told me is that if you want things done properly, you do it yourself. I don't need them anymore. Ouch. I guess that leaves Nappa and Raditz to rot in their own respective cells. But back to our main group of heroes though. The journey wasn't as speedy as Goku's ship since it was bigger and thusly reduced the craft's top speed. For this crew, the trip to the green world would take about a month or so, but that didn't mean they spent all that time just twiddling their thumbs and waiting for the clock to count down, doing nothing, of course. After all, this is Dragon Ball. Most of the characters have no social life, seemingly. During this time, Lon Jong got both educated by his mother and aunts, as well as trained a bit by his father, Boxer. 
Lon John had the best of both worlds and could really focus on his studies and training since he, being a little kid and all, loved the idea of going off on a space adventure. It tended to override the general boredom of having to look at books all the time in his pedestrian bedroom back on Earth. During this time, everyone kept each other company to some degree, but no one really tried to approach Piano. They were incredibly wary of that one, seeing as he had been King Piccolo's right hand, as well as the guy who had been haranguing Piccolo for years at this point, trying to get him to do what he wanted, but obviously not succeeding. What made them so sure he wouldn't try to pull a fast one and eject them all out into space at any moment? As a result, Piano was left well and truly alone. Well, almost. Everyone ignored him, except for Krillin, everyone's friend. Krillin couldn't take the idea of seeing Piano doing nothing and always in the corner, being actively snubbed by everybody else. So he took it upon himself to try and engage some polite conversation with Piano if that is what mutant demon children like to do in their spare time. To which the Earth Krill didn't know, but he would certainly give it a darn good go. So, it's nice that you've decided to play for the good guys for a change, right? Piano glared at this chirpy bald fellow. Granted, he was relieved to be talking to somebody here on this forsaken craft after days of nothing, but such inane small talk was something he could have rather done without. But, any port in the storm, I guess. Do not assume too much, short one. This isn't a permanent change of heart. I do this only because I want my brother back, so we can enact our revenge together! Krillin scratched his head, confused as to the unwavering mission objective. What revenge? Don't you have any other hobbies? I'm pretty sure that you should have developed some other interests by now. The world's a big place, you know. Why, you? But Piano stopped. It's very true, actually. Piano and his brethren were created to carry out a mission objective, and then when it was over, they would then act for the king in perpetuity. But, since their original king or father was no longer there, and the prince regent, Piccolo Jr., was clearly ignoring him, he was left aimless, and that stung him quite a bit. It left him feeling rather empty. Krillin shifted his stance, sensing that what he had said had gotten through a little bit. It's honestly a bit sad, you know? It's not that King Piccolo cared for you that much anyway, come to think about it. Why are you still loyal to his evil plans when he looked at you as some kind of minion rather than a son? Piano had to keep up appearances. This little one would blab to Piccolo when he was brought back. Then he'd ignore him even more, or worse, mock him. How dare you speak in such a manner about my father? Piano was on the edge emotionally speaking, but he didn't explode in anger as much as he thought he would. Take a look at Piccolo. He was created the same way you all were, and he's functioned without his dad. He's had... has stuff to do around here, you know? The whole martial arts thing. He keeps his mind busy despite being a grouch about it. Yeah, he wants to beat Boxer, but it's more of a competitive one, you know? He doesn't want to kill him anymore. In fact, I don't think he ever did want to do that. Maybe you should work on your revenge fixation a little bit, buddy? What? I don't have any sort of fixation! I just deeply desire to- Mm-hmm. You wanna repeat what you said, buddy? Piano stopped. Again, the monk had a point. Deep desire to what? Kill Boxer? Me? Everyone on the ship? All right, assume you did that. What next? Well, uh, we will rule the world, obviously. Rule the world. And how do you plan on ruling said world? Well, Piccolo would, obviously. He is the proper heir. I would be there as his steadfast and loyal assistant to do as he desires. People weren't exactly happy when your dad tried to do the same thing. What makes you think things will go more smoothly the second time around? They will have no say in that department. So, what does it matter? Krillin shrugged. Pretty sure they would oppose you. Also, I don't think Piccolo really wants to rule the world. You'll be alone with that one, buddy. Piano started to heat up again. Krillin didn't seem all that fussed, though. It had become rather monotonous, this cycle of emotion. If they will dare to do something so pointless and moronic such as that, I will crush them under my... iron... fist. The last two words did not sound that confident. Krillin sighed and passed him a portion of his ration. Listen, I don't think that would work for you, buddy. I mean, it really won't work. Even if you kill us all, 
and somehow Piccolo is convinced to help you. The Galactic Patrol's just gonna crush you before you even start. Box has got some really powerful friends. I'm just saying. So what's the point in trying for something that is ultimately not worth it? Stressing out over. Find a hobby, will ya? Piano looked around, to make sure that no one else but the bold one was in the room. He didn't want to submit to anyone else today. And how does one find a hobby? And from that moment on, Piano started to become slightly less hostile toward Krillin. He wasn't exactly a state of being that could be described as friendly, but at least they had managed to be on relatively good speaking terms. As in, he wouldn't cuss him out nine times out of ten? There is no fake Nemec. Moving on. As for the space travel itself, a month is both a lot and not enough to be prepared for when it comes to landing on an alien world. Sure, the gang were used to being around alien life forms, but that was on their home turf. To do it, when they were the alien life forms in question, was something rather daunting and wholly unprecedented. So when they landed, the natural excitement and wonder at being somewhere that no other Earthling had seen before had been mixed with a certain sense of uneasiness and foreboding, especially when they had been contacted by Jarko. Where they had landed, it turns out, was only calm because that part of the planet had not been considered as of interest to the organization which had set up shop there not too long ago. I mean, I would have said invasion, but considering that there are only about a hundred Namekians living on the planet at the time, it wasn't a contest really. Jarko explained the whole situation to the team, how Nemec was currently swarming with the troopers and minions of this evil emperor named Frieza, and how they are searching for the Dragon Balls as well. Our group decided to, with the hopeful element of surprise and stealth, warn the locals about the whole thing going down, happening around the rest of their planet, and maybe later, try and meet up with the patrollers whom they hoped would be there to assist them. Maybe Mark would be there too. And King Kai as well uses telepathy to warn Boxer about not attempting to challenge Frieza directly, as he was extremely dangerous. I know you might feel powerful after our training, but Frieza, he's a whole other level of scary. Keep yourself close to the ground, pal, and you might stand a chance. And while Goku in the original would have ignored that warning and just gone in there anyway to fight Frieza despite the major power gap, here, Boxer's more careful, despite feeling a slight natural pang of interest to fighting him. I mean, he is a Saiyan. He knew, however, thanks to his logical brain, to stay away for now. Instead of going in hot, Boxer decided that he and Krillin would scout ahead quietly, hiding their powers as best they could, while the rest should stay in a safe spot and get themselves acclimated to the environment, just in case there is an ambush or surge, or they felt like going there. It felt ironic to him in a way, as he and his sisters always wanted to see an alien planet, being huge fans of sci-fi movies when they were kids, but now they did not have the luxury of enjoying the trip anymore. Right now, this wasn't some kind of escapist fantasy. This was real. They had to be careful. Or else they might end up being offed before even getting a sniff of the Dragon Balls. Long John, though, was having none of it. He decided to sneak away after his father and Krillin had left and decided to tail them from a distance, causing a great level of distress for Chi Chi. Despite her best efforts, Long John had not been convinced to stay on the ground and wait. The allure of space was just far too strong. When the lad had caught up to Boxer and Krillin, it was too late to send him away. Both of the fighters cursed Long John's defiance, but understood he wasn't exactly a weakling, at least not anymore. Even with that crumb of comfort though, it did add an additional amount of peril for their lot going forward. Boxer simply had to contact Chi Chi and told her that he will keep their son safe as best he could but he did voice his annoyance at their son's disobedience to some extent. If this had been Earth, it would have been not so scary. So, after some scolding and additional searching, the group managed to find one of the Namekian villages, where they were greeted as friends, the Namekians being naturally benevolent to peoples. Well, I mean, before Frieza showed up, obviously. Boxer quickly explained what was happening, and that their planet had been invaded. The helpful Namekians sensed truth in their words, of the Saiyan, and gave them both the Dragon Balls that they had in their possession, and hinted as to how to get to Guru's place. If there was a safe place to warn any other villagers at once, it would be best to look for their elder, so that means he can contact everyone else. They also decided to evacuate the village that they were in right now, 
hiding in the caves scattered around the area. They then ventured to Guru's place and forwarded the details to Jarko, who arrived there with his comrades and Vegeta. Unfortunately, the message had been intercepted by none other than Kui. But luckily for our heroes, Kui and his men were overtly full of themselves, not wanting to inform anyone else, not even their boss Frieza, and have been hoping for a prize of their own so they can take all the glory, if they dealt with these interlopers personally. Vegeta and Boxer quickly forgot about their differences when they dealt with invaders, which had swayed Nail to their side. Guru then decided to unlock the potential of Boxer, Krillin and Long John, but not Vegeta, despite his efforts to stop Kui and his crew. This annoyed Vegeta quite a bit, but Guru was adamant. He could sense dark sentiments within the prince, and if he were to unlock his potential, that could spell doom for all those around him other than himself. I mean, he wasn't wrong exactly, but it was still a bitter pill to swallow. Meanwhile, Jarkum informed them that a galactic patrol force had been sent to assist them with the battle, although it may wind up being a full-scale war if Frieza decided to go all out. Vegeta claimed that he would do such a thing if he weren't going to get what he wanted so easily. Frieza always liked the nuclear option, and also, the prince noted that they would eventually notice the lack of Kui, and that they should be probably focusing on taking down the top two lieutenants of Frieza as soon as possible, those being Zarbon and Dodoria. Vegeta was sure that he could probably take on Dodoria after his little Saiyan power boost, but Zarbon, he might be a bit of a problem. Maybe with Kakarot's new power boost, it could be possible to win out if they played their cards right and they were clever. Boxer then decided to leave Lonjon under Namekian care, and asked his wife and sisters, as well as Piano, to relocate there. The pterodactyl-like alien was treated here with caution, being noted as a result of dark experiments, not a truly pure Namekian. But I mean, there was no outright resentment presented toward him. To them, he was considered a tragic example of a corrupted Namekian from long ago. They kind of felt sorry toward him in a way. But Piano didn't like that. He resented their pandering and patronizing, treating him like some kind of invalid, where he was in fact purely capable of functioning. Meanwhile, Frieza was enjoying the fact that the patrol had decided to go for an open war sort of affair. At least now he would have an excuse to destroy this outdated peacekeeping force. I mean, after all, they attacked first. However, they had reportedly lost some troops all of a sudden. So he decided to send Zarbon and Dodoria to check on their last reported location. That way, the two had managed to track our heroes, who were busy with gathering Dragon Balls. Vegeta and Boxer stood against the two of them as a proper tag team. But can they defeat them? Well, you'll find out in the next episode, as that's where we're going to be leaving things for right now. So what do you folks think? Do you think that Vegeta will stay true for this particular saga? Is Boxer strong enough against an all-out Zarbon? Leave a comment below and let's get this discussion going. And I will see you in the next video. Catch you later!